So, uh, so I was, uh, uh, you know how you, you, you get lost down tunnels of, uh, uh, like YouTube or TikTok in your case. Right. I and then you just, <clears throat> right. And then you just find yourself, uh, watching something and you're just like, I have no idea how this actually worked. Right. So it was, uh, it was, uh, uh about, uh, um, how sound waves reverberate in, in auditoriums. Right. Mm-hmm. So that when you have a, uh, a singer or a speaker in an auditorium and he's speaking and they showed all these directional arrows, how the sound waves will bounce off walls. And then it had like one individual in the middle of it and that's the hearer. And so it bounces off the wall and then it gets to the hearer and then he hears. And then, and then they said, but oddly enough, it doesn't work uh, with pigeons because acoustics I said, I said, I said, I said, acoustics. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm not, I'm not going to laugh at that to give you credit, but we're, we're going <laughs> to. Hi, kids. It's the Uncultured Saints podcast, and there's nowhere to go but up. So uh, here we go. Oh, uh, acoustics. You get yeah, it? Yeah. Yeah. No, we, we get it. Because you're talking about acoustics in an auditorium, the, yeah. like one word. And mm-hmm. then, then you break it up with a pigeon of the three words of a, uh, ku, sticks to the wall. Li- it doesn't bounce li- off. You're listening to Pastor Eli Litzow of Wheat Ridge Evangelical Lutheran Church. Uh, I, I'm, I'm Pastor Goodman in for the long haul. Uh, the content executive at Higher Things and somehow have made the choice to distribute this piece of content to you, <laughs> right. our listener, singular. Yeah, that's all we've got Singular, left. that's all, after the acoustics. Yeah, their acoustics are so bad that they can't... Uh... <laughs> that that pun was so bad. Uh, <laughs> it's amazing. It was a that's really the thing long about setup. puns. Was a re- that setup was too long for TikTok. Okay, that's, <laughs> I have the attention span of a goldfish now. You, you just would, need to bring the heat, all right? No, but you you have to set it up. It's like a Norm McDonald joke. I know, but you the need to do a little dance. The longer you draw those you out, I know. The longer you draw those out, the funnier they are, but and not for funny. You. That's but that's the brilliant. I mean, I'm no Norm McDonald, but have you ever like watched a Norm McDonald give a seven minute joke? Yeah. And the only one who laughs at the end is him. Yeah. It's awesome. I know. It's what it's all about. That, that's the hokey pokey. Um, yeah. All right. So we're doing some small cold article stuff, right? Yeah. Let's talk about keys and stuff. Um, the, the idea that the that Jesus wants your sins forgiven. And so he, he has a place where you can go and get that, right? Yeah. So, okay. So we're doing article, what is that? Seven of part three. If people are following along at home with their they own are. little pocket uh, small cold articles. Right, that's, that's the thing people have. Yeah, <laughs> I've I've got a I've got a a, a a travel version of the Book of Concord. Keep it in you mind. Know what I have, I have I have a smartphone. Oh, yeah, check, what's gonna just, what's gonna that. happen when when uh, when Putin shuts off the energy and your smartphone doesn't work? Then what are you gonna do? I there's a, a couple of things I, I'd probably throw a flag on in that statement. <laughs> Let's maybe talk theology instead. <laughs> Okay. Let's prove that fair we don't enough. know as much as we think we do about this instead of that. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> All right, so the keys are an office and power given by Christ to the church for the binding and loosing of sin. That's right. that's the office of the keys. So uh, your pastor can say in the stead and by the command of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and no more sins. Jesus wants your sins forgiven. Absolutely. That's the whole. That's the whole purpose of it. And the office of the keys is. We've talked about this. And we might have talked about it last time, uh, in regard to the gospel and baptism and the sacrament of the altar. The way in which uh, the forgiveness of sins won on the cross is actually distributed in time and space to us, right? Um, and it, it happens in baptism and sacrament of the altar. It happens in this office of the keys of. And we're going to hear uh, in the next article with the confession of this, the, the proclamation of the word, uh, as well in regard to that, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and so our, our Lord actually ties the forgiveness of sins to things that we can hear, things that we can touch, things that we can taste, so that we can know that, yes, this for certain is yours. It is mine. The forgiveness of sins that Jesus spoke about is ours. It's for assurance. 
Right. And and that's because it's meant to be distributed. Uh, one of the things that kind of gets uh, locked up in this is who gets to forgive sins? And the answer is the church. The Office of the Keys is given to right. the church. Um, now, the, the church will usually put somebody there. Uh, the, the church will, in fact, always put somebody there to, to be the main speaker of it. That's your pastor who, who stands in the stead of Christ to, to uh, exercise these keys. But they don't belong to any one man. Like, you're not in charge of who gets forgiven and who doesn't, are you? No. And see, that's the that's the thing, too, that I, I think a lot of people uh, uh, from, uh, let's say, the uh, uh, this side of the pendulum swinging from the, the Protestants, right, um, that they don't like this whole uh, idea of pastors saying, I forgive you, mm-hmm. right, uh, in, in the divine service or in, in private confession and absolution, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, but they don't like that that uh, that singular pronoun, I, right? Um, uh, they would much rather uh, just hear it uh, kind of uh, either either as a, a plural, like we, the church forgives you, or just a statement of fact, you are forgiven, right? Of But not, I forgive you. Um, so they have an issue with that. It, it, but it's like you said, it's not the pastor uh, deciding which sins get to be forgiven and which sins don't. It's not the pastor taking a look at you and saying, nah, I don't think you're sorry enough for this one. Um, it's the pastor standing in the stead of Christ, proclaiming Christ's forgiveness. And so when Christ speaks a word of forgiveness over something, the pastor can do nothing except do the very same thing. And when right. Christ he, actually to do that, right, exactly. And, and then when Christ actually does speak against, uh, against things as well, in regard to, uh, people, uh, denying him and denying, uh, his forgiveness one, uh, well, the, the pastor is standing in Christ's stead has the authority and the place to say those same things as well. But again, it's not his words, it's Christ's words, which is why in uh, private confession absolution, uh, for those of you who have gone through it, you've probably heard this word and and, and pastors are familiar with it. uh, Almost every single time we actually start off uh, right before the absolution, uh, saying something uh, along the lines of, uh, do you, uh, do you believe that this isn't my forgiveness, but Christ's forgiveness? This isn't this isn't Eli speaking. This isn't this isn't Harrison speaking. This is Christ speaking. Right. And, and the answer is yes, you're not speaking new words. In fact, you were sent to tell me this thing that Jesus sent you to tell me in the same way that like, you know, when I was a kid, my little sister was sent to tell me it's time to come in for dinner. And that was mom speaking, even if it was her voice. Right. And if you didn't. It's mom's. You could. Angry. Yeah. 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 It's, it, she comes in and says, why didn't you listen to your sister? Oh, well, I just thought it was my sister talking. No, not me. No, I sent her to tell you to get your butt in for dinner. Right. Exactly. Right, and, and there's there's actually a gift in this. Um, it, it, it's not just that I know who can actually speak God's words for me, but now it also doesn't have to be his problem to figure out which sins are forgivable and which sins are too bad or anything else. Because if it is God's forgiveness given through the church, uh, well, then it, it's, it's not in our power to judge which or how great or how many the sins are. It's just our job to answer with Jesus' words, your sins are forgiven you. Right. Well, do you want to do you want to talk a little bit about the binding because the the, the small called articles do talk about that we we oftentimes within the Lutheran Church kind of want to uh, gloss over the binding of it right but it is uh, this is the keys of the uh, it says the keys are an office power given by Christ to his church for binding and loosing of sin as we hear in Matthew chapter 16 so what what do we say about the binding then I mean, we usually we kind say, of wait until Article 9, but it's a really short paragraph, so we can just knock it out real quick. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it's this. We, we say, look, if, if you don't believe that this is a, a, a thing, well, then you shouldn't be here. Um, but that's, that's a choice that you're making. So really, the, the question to sin is, is this thing that's going on in your life a good thing or a bad thing? And Christians say, well, it's a bad thing. And Jesus says, well, your sins are forgiven. You be at peace. Uh, if you respond instead, you know what? It's a good thing. Uh, I, 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 I am a hard-hearted sinner. I, I, I don't want forgiveness for this. Then Jesus says, well, okay, but then stop, stop eating the things that forgive you if you don't want forgiveness for this. Excommunication right. is, is Jesus saying out loud the thing that you're saying first to him. Yeah, and so the, the, the binding uh, language that we use here, that Christ use, uses, <clears throat> shouldn't be all that, 
it shouldn't be all that discomforting to us. Although uh, I think a lot of people uh, hear it as such. They hear it as your pastor gets to gets to choose so that if you come in for this private confession absolution and we're kind of weaving our way in, into article eight uh, as well but if you come in for this private confession absolution and you say the sin that is troubling your conscience um there's the, there's the fear of that oh but the pastor has this binding thing too what if he binds this sin what if he says this one isn't forgiven it's it it, it it, we as sinners want to be afraid of that sort of thing. And yet, as as you just pointed out, Pastor Goodman, that, that's not the way in which our Lord is, is, is laying it out. Right? The, the, the office of the keys is, is a proclamation of sins forgiven that Christ won on the cross. And here it is for you today. And the whole binding aspect of it would play into an individual saying, oh, no, 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 I, I don't need forgiveness of sins there. Thanks, but no thanks. Uh, Jesus didn't die on the cross for that because I don't, I don't need it forgiven. You can keep those words to, for, for yourself. Well, all right, well, then, then I, I suppose your, your sins are bound then. Right. Right. So for us then, uh, because we, we sort of recognize the people who are excommunicated, especially in this day and age, they just they <clears throat> stop coming to church. It's not that they keep coming to church and then fight with you about communion. It, it, it very rarely. It, it's it's that they don't want to be near God's word, and that's really what excommunication is. It, it's not a I want you gone from this house forever, and I want you in hell. But I want you to realize just what it is that you're passing up. Yeah, and in that way, I, okay. So I guess we are including the the fullness of Article Nine as well, uh, so we don't have to do that next time. We'll circle um, back around. We'll circle circle back. What what's the what's the church's purpose? Is it is it uh, is it a final um, uh, a threat? Is it a final punishment? Does the church rejoice in the excommunication? I guess let's put it that way. Or what's what's from from the church's perspective? What's the the purpose of excommunication? To drive you towards the gospel, right? Right. It's it's almost this last ditch effort. Uh, for the church as a whole, and most of the time, uh, I guess I'm, I'm I'm making an assumption here. Most of the time, there's a lot of uh, criteria for congregations that they have to go through in order to actually proclaim somebody excommunicated, and it's not just a pastor going willy nilly on his own and doing whatever he wants. It's speaking with the elders, and it, there, there's a lot of stuff involved with this, and and it has to be a long, uh, 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 drawn out process of this. Um, but again, it's not uh, it's not for the pastor to to uh, leap for joy that this uh, horrible sinner is no longer hearing the gospel. This is kind of a last ditch effort of of the law being proclaimed to to show you sin and and turn you right that uh, that the Holy Spirit works through this this law proclaimed to show your sin and turn you towards the gospel. It's this last ditch effort for that, saying, "Listen, the the things that you call are good." Uh, uh, the church sees them as as so atrocious, atrocious um, that that we're saying that you, you can't take and eat and take and drink because you're you're denying the forgiveness that Christ won for that. Like this is a big deal, um, and it's all again to to in the hopes of driving the sinner to repentance and forgiveness. Right, and, and you said this word deplorable, um, which it, it's not a loaded term at all. Um, so when we talk about that, again, we're not saying the thing that you did was so bad. We're saying the idea that you don't want Jesus is not healthy. So right. that's, that's deplorable. That's so bad. That's the atrocious thing. Right. And, and, and so <clears throat> the, uh, the uh, deplorableness could come from something as, as simple, and now I'm just being silly, but something as stealing a cookie and 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 uh, just railing against the fact that there's there's no need for this sin to ever be forgiven because it's not a sin, or it's this whatever. Think of the worst thing that you could think of from mm -hmm. a temporal aspect. Um, right. But again, we shouldn't we shouldn't come into uh, uh, this idea and this this conversation of confession or the keys or sins bound or sins retained or, or forgiven uh, based upon levels of how bad sin is. The no. whole idea of binding and excommunication has nothing to do with levels of, of badness. It has to do with whether or not 
uh, the gospel is is uh, received or or rejected. Right, and, and did I, we, did I say that right? Yeah, yeah. We we want the gospel to be received and not rejected. Right. So so this actually lets us then talk about the the, the right and proper use of it, um, because yes, there are two keys: a loosing and a binding key. Uh, but if you understand the purpose, even of the, the binding key is to drive us towards, again, forgiveness and not hell, then that's that's sort of the uncomfortable and, and it's the alien use. It, it's not the proper use of the keys. The keys are meant to open the doors of heaven for you. And so we talk about confession then chiefly in terms of, of absolution. So confession has two parts. First, that we confess our sins and second, that we receive absolution. That is forgiveness from the pastor is from God himself, not doubting, but firmly believing that by it our sins are forgiven before God in heaven. <gasps> and it's good. Right. Yeah, I, 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 you use those fancy theological terms of proper work and alien work, um, but it, it's good for us to hear that. Like the, the gospel is the proper work of God. That's what He desires to give unto salvation, and then the alien work is going to be that law. It's that uh, showing us our sin, um, and yet that's even God even uses that alien work to drive us like, once again to hear this gospel proclaim this christ crucified for you right this is actually what luther's all about in the small called article so he opens the, the whole thing on confession with this that uh absolution is supposed to be an aid against sin and a consolation for a bad conscience uh, a consolation for a bad conscience that that you shouldn't be left in despair by the law but you should be driven to the gospel and so when you have a broken conscience when you have a burdened conscience when when you when you are, are terrified of of things falling apart there is absolution. Your sins are forgiven you. Yeah. Let's, let's hear this proclamation of, of what the cross has won and, and now gives in time and space. <clears throat> that's, that's the whole purpose of it. Christ does not want you to, to sit there in your, uh, in your sin terrified. He wants you to be comforted knowing that it's forgiven. Um, one of the things, I don't know if you wanted to go down uh, this, this, uh, this path, but for, for Luther himself... Um, one of the uh, the main issues that he was trying to uh, uh, tackle uh, in regards to just the historical context and for the consciences of the, the, the people within Lutheran congregations throughout Germany is that once the Pope had excommunicated uh, Luther and a, a bunch of other reformers uh, because he basically said they were teaching false doctrine by t teaching the gospel, um, then the, the Pope would say, well, then anything that, the, that these pastors are doing in the office of pastor isn't valid. And the, and the reason for that was that uh, the Roman Catholic Church sees the office of the keys not given to the church, but given to the man, namely the which Pope. Man, which man, the, yeah. exactly, namely the Pope. So that there's one man standing at the top, and if you want to kind of view it as an umbrella here, he's standing at the top. Or like a pyramid scheme, hypothetically. I'm just maybe, maybe right? Like a, like a like a triangle <laughs> shape scheme. Maybe, uh, maybe a scheme, right? Yeah. Uh, but he's at the he's at the pinnacle, and then uh, everything else flows through him. So he and he alone has the authority to forgive sins. Uh, he's the vicar of Christ on earth, and then each person under him, so we've got cardinals and bishops and whatever the case might be, uh, they're standing almost in the stead of the Pope. Right. Right? Not in the stead of Christ, but they're standing in the stead of the Pope for giving sins here. Well, what's the problem with that umbrella or that pyramid scheme, as you said? Uh, if if you've got uh, the cardinals and the bishops and, and, and the, the, the priests and all of this and the deacons... Um, are under the Pope, and now you've got Luther over here. Well, then there's there's no umbrella. Um, right, he's not under the umbrella. Right, but you you know what the real problem with that though is now you you have an umbrella that's not the Word of God. You, you're right. standing under something other than the Word of God, um, and if you're standing under something other than the Word of God, it means that you're standing above it. Um, if the the Spirit is above the Word, that means the Word is subject to whoever has the Spirit. You, you get that, right? Like if, if the Pope is actually in charge of the forgiveness of sins of all the treasury of merit, uh, first, I guess, like also, wouldn't he just be a cool dude if he gave it away instead of sold it? Uh, but that's a different thesis. Um, yeah, that's, but, eh, yeah, um, debatable. 95 debates. <laughs> um, so instead of this, we can say, look, um, 
the word of God actually says that God wants the forgiveness of sins preached to all nations. So the word of God also says that Jesus died to win that forgiveness of sins. And the word of God says that, that the preaching should continue from this time forth until the last great day. It's pretty simple what you have to do. In your church, your pastor has to tell you, penitent sinners, that your sins are forgiven. We we stand right. under the word so that it's not on somebody's own shoulders to figure out what the word says, which sins are actually forgiven, which sins need to be earned for forgiveness, which which you know which which you need to, to atone for by yourself, which you need some purgatory for, which all of, there's there's so many extra things instead of just the word says Jesus died for you, your sins are forgiven. Right, and that's the beauty of. Uh, the office of the keys being given to the bride uh, of the bridegroom, right? Uh, to the church and not to an individual, not to people. Um, because uh, people are, we're, we're going to screw it up. We're terrible. Like if we, we are the worst. If we get to decide uh, who gets forgiven and who doesn't, uh, maybe some of the time we're going to get that right. But, but a lot of the time, unfortunately, uh, uh, we're going to... Um, we're going to put our own ideas into these things. And then we're going to heap more burdened conscience upon you uh, so that uh, you, you, you don't have any comfort uh, of whether or not you're forgiven. Or if you want comfort, you're going to be looking at, at it in other places, right? If you are contrite enough, if you're really sorry, um, if your life shows it now, right? If you've been able to conquer that sin today that you couldn't yesterday, now now there's your comfort that your sins are forgiven. That's how the sinner is going to implement this, if the keys are given to the sinner. But they aren't. They're given to the church. There's a really, really important point behind this, too. And it's, it's actually, I think, maybe one of my favorite lines in the entire book of Concord. Mm-hmm. Um, if all of these things are given to the sinner, that means that ultimately these things are going to start in your heart and, and then have to radiate outward. You can measure them uh, by your works, by your attitude, by your results, whatever you want. But if it starts in here, you have to measure something. But instead, God wants the forgiveness given through outward words. The words from the outside in to address your heart. You you don't see whether or not you're really forgiven by whether or not you fell back into that sin, but whether or not Jesus is risen from the dead and that that proclamation was made to you. Yeah. Yeah. Jeremiah says something, and and I'm paraphrasing here, uh, but he he says uh, that we uh, we probably shouldn't uh, uh, find uh, comfort in, in our hearts because from the heart comes all evil deceit, right, and lies and wickedness and hatred. I'm glad Luther's quoting um, Jeremiah then because he he goes so far as to say, uh, it's my favorite line, God does not want to deal with us in any other way than through the spoken word and sacraments. Whatever is praised is from the spirit without the word and the sacraments is the devil himself. Yeah, that's a big thing. That's a big thing. Like if, if, right. if my idea of, of God loves me is I have the tingly winglies in my heart, but not from the word or the sacraments, that's demonic. And, and that doesn't mean that it's good to, it's bad to feel good. But what it means is if you're going to measure whether or not God is near by feeling good, when you need him the most, he's going to feel the farthest away. And that is very much the work of the devil. Yeah. And Luther, in, uh, you know, uh, in, in his Luther way, uh, especially the Luther who thinks he's going to die and then mm-hmm. doesn't, uh, doesn't care what he's saying or how he's saying it. And uh, I'm curious if he would have uh, made this a, a little bit more uh, uh easy on the ears but he's basically saying uh if if you think god is speaking to you uh in any way other than his word and sacraments uh it's the demons the and devil's that, doing it that's good because the gospel has already been proclaimed and, and the, the finality of it is a joy because now there's nothing else to add jesus died jesus rose you are baptized your sins are forgiven hear that as if it cannot be undone and if you want to add to that again that's demonic yeah, and so you see this all over the place. And again, that's not to say, and I think we, I'm sure we've spoken about this before, that's not to say that God can't work in other ways. It's to say that God has not promised to work in other ways. That God has actually tied himself to these things, not to make himself weaker, uh, but for our assurance. Right. So that I can know, oh, how do I know That my sins are forgiven because Christ said, your sins are forgiven. He says, office of the keys, confession, absolution, baptism, Lord's Supper, word proclaimed, 
mutual consolation of the brethren. He says, these are the ways in which you know for certain. You don't know for certain uh, when you see uh, the clouds parting and a ray of sunshine comes down. That's and not how you know for certain. I'm going to push on it just a little bit, so feel free to reel me back in. Uh, that's also not just sort of sitting in, in your bedroom reading your Bible by yourself. The word is Ooh. proclaimed. I'm not saying that the, the written word is not efficacious or, or salvific, but I'm saying that it was given that it would be proclaimed back and forth. That the reason you have a pastor is so that you would never, ever, ever be lost in the law without hearing the words of the gospel for you. Because when it comes to the law, I will do anything but hear the words for you. Uh, right. And when it comes to the gospel, the same. I don't think I'm going to push back uh, too far because I think we can always make the uh, uh, desert island uh, um you know, weird scenario of you're alone on a desert island and you got a Bible. What are you supposed to do? Blah blah blah. The point, I think, I think that the the greater point is not to, to to go down that avenue of trying to find the exception, but to say, okay, uh, we don't make rules based on exceptions. You're not on a desert island. Get your butt in church. Right. I mean, this but, is but how brother, our Lord is. Wouldn't it be go good if, if you could actually hear from somebody else that this was for you? Like that, sure. that's what it's about. Right. And again, that's, isn't that the comfort? It's, it's the uh, outside of you uh, word proclaimed, the ex nihilo, right? The uh, somebody standing in the stead of Christ saying this is for you. And again, I, 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 don't, think, I don't think anybody wants to go so far as to say uh, that uh, if, if you were in a uh, 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 communist uh, USSR and you stumbled upon a Bible uh, and you read it, uh, that you couldn't be brought to faith. Um, I think we would say uh, that when that takes place, the, the Spirit also almost immediately drives people to, to make churches, even if they are underground and secret, so that they can have a word proclaimed, and they can share these things with other people and hear them from other people. Right, uh, because like ultimately, at, at the end of the day, um, understand who these three main enemies are that, that Luther talks about in the Catechism. They are the devil, the world, and your own sinful flesh. So the word, if it's only being dealt with by my own sinful flesh, oddly enough, my sinful flesh is going to try and twist the word, and it's going to turn the gospel into law and the law into gospel over and over again. I, I need something to come and straighten that out for me. I need a, a, an <clears throat> apostolic Christian faith. Uh, I, I need a pastor. I, I need a church. I, I need brothers and sisters in Christ. We, we're given the sacraments so that there would be an assurance that this isn't just floating in the ether, but it's actually mine. Um, I cannot simply let my own sinful flesh sort of commandeer the scriptures because very right. quickly it will try and stand above them. So instead, the, the church has been given these things so that you would be a part of the church and not your own Christian on your own private island, which is what you really want, which is why we always play Desert Island. It's, it's not so that I, I, uh, I, I can figure out what to do in case of an emergency with a shipwreck because I've never been on a ship, uh, but rather it's how can I imagine a church where you aren't there and I don't have to put up with you? Right. Because if we can make the, if we can make the, the argument for a Desert Island scenario, then you can also make the, uh, the argument for well, I guess I don't have to be on the desert island. I could just, then I can just stay in my room. And that is good enough because it would be good enough on a desert island. See, so that's how that works. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly the, the opposite of what our Lord says. I wanted to, uh, and I don't know uh, what our time is here. Uh, we're probably coming up to it. I, I, I wanted yeah. to uh, tackle two more things just real quickly. I just um, want to point out real quick, if that setup for the pun wasn't eight minutes long, we would have more time. It wasn't it was eight minutes. It wasn't Nine, eight minutes. It was ten. It's it seemed that long. It, I bet when we play it back, it's that like was 40 forty-two seconds. TikToks long. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and it made it all that much better. Because if it wasn't that long, you wouldn't remember it. So, anyways, uh, there's two there's two things uh, two things that I wanted to, to make sure we touch on. Uh, I'll, I'll get the first, and maybe I'll I'll, I'll kick the second to you. Um, Luther, uh, a lot of, in this article, he spends a lot of time talking about uh, enthusiasm or enthusiasts in, in, in past uh, episodes and seasons. I'm sure we've touched on this. Uh, enthusiasm or enthusiast is just a, a fancy language that Luther is using. You might hear your pastor talking about it or you might come up, uh, uh, upon it in a paper or whatnot. It's just fancy way of saying, um, I'm looking for uh, the Holy Spirit to work in ways other than 
his word proclaimed and his sacraments given. So if that's what you're doing, Luther would call you an enthusiast, right? Mm -hmm. And the odd thing here is he says that Satan is the first enthusiast. Mm -hmm. And and then he he also will then say in, in the Garden of Eden, uh, Adam and Eve, they were the first ones to succumb to enthusiasm. Because uh, Satan is proclaiming something other than God's word. Uh, and the... Uh, 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 Adam and Eve are then trying to find comfort in something other than God's word. Did yeah. God really say, well, no, my rational logic thinks differently. Ooh, I can be like God if I do this. Ooh, I'll know the difference between good and evil. Ooh, all of this is wonderful stuff apart from God's word. They're enthusiasts. It's never going to end well. Right. And so if, if that was the if enthusiasm, if this uh, looking for God's promises and his, his, his gospel to be given to you outside of his word or his sacraments, if that's the way in which sin came into this world, and if that's the way that all false doctrine started, that's probably going to be the vast majority of the way in which most false doctrine continues. It's going to be some vein of enthusiasm, some vein of I'm not going to God's word or sacraments to hear his promises for me. I'm going somewhere else. Yep. The last thing I wanted to do is because uh, we don't do this very much. And Luther, uh, Luther will talk about that. Or maybe we do, but it's not a, a, a it's not a practice that that is wide, uh, I think, in the vast majority of the LCMS churches. Um and uh, Luther doesn't talk about it all that much uh, specifically, but if you get the reader's edition of, of the Book of Concord here, uh, the note above will talk about the fact that Luther is not trying to do away with private uh, confession and absolution. And yet when we find ourselves in 2022, uh, the vast majority of our congregations don't have it. So is it needed? Is it good? I, when I say don't have it, I say uh, I should say uh, it isn't practiced that often and that consistently within a lot of congregations and most congregants. I might disagree with you. So, by okay. by private confession, like let let's frame it in the right way. So it, it's that your pastor tells you your sins are forgiven, and you happen to be the only one in the room. So right. um, that's that's. You're right that that not a lot of churches like have hours set up or confessionals, even though they're they're not bad things in and of themselves. Uh, where like your pastor will just sit there, and if you want to go to private confession on a Tuesday from three to four p.m., you you can. But at the same time, um, private confession is is simply the idea that your pastor will forgive you your sins anytime you ask him. Um, and, and there, I think you you might actually find a lot more private confession that, than you you realize. In fact, every shut in visit is private confession. Um, every time you you interact with one of your people and, and they talk about sins, uh, what do you do? You say, "Well, that's too bad. Try harder next time." No, you say, "Jesus forgives you." L we'll go from there. Um, right. That that private confession, it, it's it's not sort of a how can I really embarrass myself by telling my pastor every bad thing I've ever done so that he can remember it, look down on me, and probably tell other people. But rather, um, God does not sit in heaven and say, I am going to forgive your sins, but only on Sundays at 1030. If you do something dumb on Tuesday, you need to feel bad all week. That's the punishment. Rather, he says, the forgiveness of sins is always being proclaimed. If you need to hear it right now for the sake of your conscience, call your pastor. He is eager to tell you. And after that, it's gone. It's as far as the east is from the west. So he's got nothing left to talk about. And, and quite frankly, he's bored by sin anyway. He deals with it all the time. It's never going to be something that, that really sh shakes him anymore. Um, right. He, he actually just wants to tell you your sins are forgiven. Yeah. Uh, I, I think uh, from my perspective and my experiences, uh, more often than not, uh, uh, you almost stumble into private confession absolution. People don't show up expecting, I, this is what I'm going to do. Uh, and yet after it's all said and done, you can almost say, oh, okay, we, we just did confession absolution, didn't we? Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, goodness, I guess, I guess we did. And it was a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. You got to hear that that sin, that one, that was mm -hmm. troubling your conscience so much that you actually had to speak about it. Um, that one's forgiven. Right. That's, that's, that's a good thing. And that's how Luther will talk about it here, too. Uh, that uh, uh, private confession absolution, 
is is a very good thing because you get to hear about that particular sin that is burdening your conscience as forgiven and you don't have to worry about uh thinking and remembering every single one of your sins or that your pastor is going to sit there judge you or like you said say oh wow you you really screwed that one up you should have done better nope it's for forgiveness of sins and and you should have that that that's enough right that's good all right, you you got any closing puns, or are we just gonna leave it there? No, no, come on, no, I don't. So I don't do thing, that. I, I don't do that. Right, good. We acoustics. Out. <laughs>